With the nature of Fire Emblem narratives primarily focused on war and its various themes, in tandem with gameplay that is designed around utilizing various classes and weapons among other factors, the effectiveness of each individual varies considerably over the course of the franchise. Some units are relatively on the level, others start to be pretty good but not top tier, a few have considerably limited types of utility, a small minority take a while to get going but end up becoming potent, a handful start great but fall behind in the long run, and then there's Camilla who's all kinds of yes, it's not every day a Fire Emblem unit has big breasts and big bases. <laughs> That being said, not all the partisans that partake in the war effort end up making a difference, and begs the question of how they made it into the army in the first place. Whether it be bad numbers all around, an unfavourable class line, heavily overshadowed by the competition, knocking on the door long after closing time, a pain in the ass to rally their spirit, or all of the above, at the end of the day, not all enthusiasts are created equal. In fact, some occupants are so bad, they are literally dead on arrival. And that's not an exaggeration, right Donald? Ah. Uh with these 10 travesties that loiter at the lowest end of the spectrum. So join me everyone, as it's time to determine once and for all which of our allies, quote unquote, has VIP access to the oh so beautiful bench, as I count down the top 10 absolute worst Fire Emblem units. Now this is usually the part where I say this video is purely my opinion, and when it comes to the placement of each entry, that's very much true. When it comes to determining what makes these units bad, all my points are based on objective evidence and observations that have nothing to do with things like support conversations and overall characterization, or optional factors like grinding, reclassing, and stat boosting items, since by utilizing those elements, just about any unit can be effective. To an extent. Now keep in mind, a select number of infantry have been present within multiple Fire Emblem games. So if one of them just so happens to make it on this countdown, I'll outline how each version performs, but primarily focus on their irredeemable incarnations. And it goes without saying that Heroes plays absolutely no part in this. Additionally, if you don't think the units I've listed are as bad as I claim them to be, or are as a matter of fact worse than the rank I've bestowed upon them, that's fine, you have every right to feel whichever way. But the fact of the matter is, they're bad units at the end of the day. Though I would like to stress, if you just so happen to like any of these combatants for whatever reason, that's fantastic, I'm glad you were able to find joy in taking the time out to train them. And I too enjoy utilizing certain trash tier troopers, but no amount of personal experience will change the fact that they suck the big one. Something I wish I knew years ago, but hey, you live and learn. And with all that cleared up, it's time for me to trim the fat and ostracize those who only serve to hinder progression. And when the world is being threatened by dragons, demons, deities, and a fuck ton of dickheads, the last thing any Fire Emblem Lord needs are those who would be better off dead. Miranda a common conundrum I've observed to continually spate the series is that considerable competition has habitually been one of the biggest setbacks for a vast number of Fire Emblem units that join late. After all, if there's a good chunk of allies of a similar disposition that have already cemented their effectiveness, what's the point in trying to invest in an individual that does the exact same thing only worse? Look Nino, you're adorable and all, but please go sit on the bench before you hurt yourself. I was only trying to help. That's not to say latecomers are all but useless, after all, Pent is a powerhouse. Miranda, however, I feel is pretty damn miserable, and dubiously designed to ensure that life only gets harder as time goes on. I've heard of not being able to catch a break, but this is borderline bullshit! Miranda bears the unfortunate curse of two glaring issues, late joining time and unpromoted at level 5 with low bases, and I'm talking no stat aside from HP is above 10 low. Already she's off to a bad start, as her low numbers will make it difficult for her to get kills by conventional means, bad weapon rank not helping in the slightest, putting her at an excessive risk, especially considering there's only 11 chapters left, and bruh, I ain't got time to train no newbies! Her class line is not only better utilized for the likes of Asbel, Olwen, Salem, and Homer, WRONG HOMER! No! Additionally, doesn't benefit Miranda's build, as her Mage Knight promotion, despite gifting her with extra movement, won't amount to much primarily due to her piss poor strength and con. This means she'll hit for piss with all but the magical sword and be weighed down by even the blandest of blades. Oh, and by the way, she only has one pursuit critical coefficient, and no, it doesn't increase. You seeing this? So far, all the odds seem to be stacked against Miranda, but she's not completely hopeless as thankfully she does aggregate good growth rates, with HP, Magic, Skill and Speed all being above 50%, so some lucky level ups can help to offset her defects to a certain degree. She is also capable of utilising Wrath, which is admittedly very risky considering her low statistics, but thankfully the enemies in Thracia I'd say are a bit on the easy side, so training her is far from impossible just ultimately pointless bearing in mind her fellow casters, and the fact that Miranda's kit only seeks to hold her back as much as possible, and the last thing any Fire Emblem unit needs is to dread promotion, otherwise as Reggie would say, Why bother? Puff of Radiant Soph Class utility can be that one ace in the hole that grants users a free pass from being bolted to the bench even if they suck dick in all other areas, quite literally in the context of Charlotte since, well, 
you know. <gasps> Did I do that? Staff usage, high mobility, dancing, pair up bonuses and so on can excuse all manner of mediocre martyrs. To a certain degree, since so from Path of Radiance clearly didn't get the memo, as no amount of lot picking will shy away from the reality of how life has it out for this little guy, such a degree where I can wholeheartedly declare him to be the worst unit in Fire Emblem 9. Just be glad Radiant Dawn took pity on you, otherwise Makai would be better off alone. Sometimes I'm not sure why I even bother. The stowaway known as Soap joins, or more accurately, worms his way into the Grail Mercenaries during Chapter 12, whose primary function is to open chests and find treasure. Now, since his join time is okay, you could make the argument that this, along with his role as a thief, prevents him from being, at the very least, one of the worst units in the series, which I personally would agree with, if not for Volk. Not only does the abnormal assassin join with better stats in all fields minus magic, but Volk also signs on two chapters earlier, and though costing 50 gold pieces per pick compared to Soap's free charge, money is not an issue at all in Path of Radiance, so it might as well be free given the amount of golden showers I can indulge us in. Compounding the issue is that Soap's bases will get him killed very easily, he's a foot unit in one of the most mounted focused Fire Emblem games, while simultaneously being knife locked, which last time I checked isn't a good weapon to be stuck with in FE9. And while I will openly admit that his growths are good and get better with Blossom, Volks aren't too shabby in the slightest. Plus, so strengths I summarized to be made superfluously redundant by his refusal to promote, so even if he's RNG blessed, at best most of his stats will cap at 20. Overall, Volk to me makes so completely irrelevant, as at no point did I feel that he should deploy more than one thief on whatever level. Personally speaking, however, as hard as it is to make Surf worthwhile, I do like using him. Though, that's primarily due to his Radiant Dawn transfer bonuses, which isn't even necessary considering base Surf is great in that game, and I admire his support. Especially with Astrid, they are such a lovely couple. Unfortunately, only one of these children can make a name for themselves during the Mad King's War, and sadly, Surf isn't winning any awards for the next three years. Though I find it strange that once Soap hits his prime, Astrid really falls off the deep end. Because fuck you and your happy ending. <laughs> Violent. Something I personally find fascinating is that since the story of Marth has been traversed no less than four times, the performance of specific soldiers occasionally oscillates between each retread of the Hero King's journey. Take for example Pala, who went from great to godlike, Lin, who really hit her stride in FE3 and 12, heck, Marth himself can't seem to make up his mind of whether he wants to be S-tier or shit-tier. In spite of all this back and forth, certain militants remain steadfast no matter the interpretation. And sad to say, Violin began his life as a bad unit with his status left unchanged after all this time. In fact, I think the only hope he has of becoming good is heroes, and I don't see that happening anytime soon considering how many people are still in that waiting room. What a bunch of misfits and freaks we got here! Oh, I love it! Violin, just like Miranda, is a curious case of having strenuous competition. After all, the Arcanair games are filled to the brim with horseback units. To the point where, even though his joint time is okay in Shadow Dragon, I view to stand no chance against the multitude of mercenaries that precede him, especially since the likes of Kane, Abel, and Jagan could stop him something fierce. Violent isn't exactly off to the best start, but what I conclude to drag him down even further into hell is that he's got low bases and poor growths in FE1, 3, and 11 minus HP and weapon level. Compounding this concern is that he starts at level 1 so it'll be a while before he can even promote, and in FE12, though his growths are better and he joins promoting, his stats are still awful, and appearing in chapter 18, I figure to be far too late for him to be viable, since there's only 4 chapters left. Well, 6 to be technical, but the point still stands. To Violent's credit, his class line is perfectly fine across all four games, and in FE12 he at least starts with a Silver Lance and has a B-Rank in both weapons, so there's that, but Violent is an ill-fated example of extreme inundation, as the sheer volume of Cavaliers present throughout all four games makes Violent, to me, one of the most worthless participants in each entry. God knows I'd never used him until this video. Were this poor paladin present within a different universe, perhaps fate would have been kinder to him. Except Radiant Dawn because the ledgers say fuck you and your ape move, but as the situation stands, Violin may as well be invisible in the context of mass memoirs, as he could just as easily be excluded from the game, and not a single fuck would be given that day. Fiona Unit balancing is an issue that I noticed to continuously infect the franchise, though as time went on, the goal of making all units relatively equal persistently drew closer, but every now and then this property would fall flat on its face in the process. Look, I don't know who's responsible for overseeing revelations, but that person needs to be fired. For what? The unit balancing? For everything! Radiant Dawn I wholeheartedly believe to be the worst case offender due to the quantity of stupidly overpowered and embarrassingly abysmal allies, with Fiona being the latter of the two, because god knows the Dawn Brigade can never have a fun time. No seriously, you all suck! 
Part 1 of Radiant Dawn, I always alleged to be reasonably difficult by Fire Emblem standards due to the majority of the cast range from mediocre to just plain bad units regarding performance, though there do exist Gallant Guardian Angels. And despite being one of the last layabouts recruited in Dayan's Liberation and in charge of her own battalion, Fiona is from my standpoint the absolute weakest. As you may have already guessed, she constitutes bad bases, however hers are so appalling that most not all adversaries will kill her without so much as breaking a sweat. So if you plan on using her, I would advise force feeding her bonus EXP as if her life depended on it, which it does. As if the situation couldn't get any shoddier, the fact that she begins Lancelot in an axe dominated game with only two chapters to deploy until part 3, with both maps being home to various ledges that make her mouse utility a bane instead of a boon, subsidizes to being in all probability the worst mouse unit in the game. Yes, not even this fuck nugget is as feeble as Fiona, and it pains me to say that. I furthermore find it to be highly problematic that due to Radiant Dawn jumping between armies so frequently, I personally find the ideal strategy to be selecting a portion of viable units and making them as potent as possible. Therefore, in light of Fiona's preposterous position and performance, using her makes an already difficult game Dark Souls levels of daunting minus the satisfaction. And don't get me wrong, there are other bad units too like Vika and Meg, but even they can be at least some use for one or two chapters, whereas Fiona kicks the bucket before she even settles up. Fortunately for this valiant lady, taking the time to train her, though an objectively stupid move, which I do all the time, can bear some very flavorous and fruit, as I find her to have rather impressive growth rates that focus on bulk, plus her skill set, weapon rank and affinity aren't too shabby either. So given enough time, patience, or whatever else it takes to get through Radiant Dawn, Fiona might be able to see herself through to the end. Though I'm personally not looking forward to using her in the Radiant Dawn Let's Play, even if I am cursed to make bad units good. After all, I was able to work wonders with the next woeful warrior. Gwendolyn. Armonites from a statistical standpoint have been home to a vast collection of pitiful patrons, as the class as a whole is often considered one of the objectively worst throughout the entire franchise, because poor speed, Lancelot before promotion and poor movement equals a steaming pile of NOPE. Thankfully, this division isn't completely irredeemable thanks to the likes of Radiant Dawn Gaintree, Oswin and Effie, but the majority of them suck the big one, with Gwendolyn being without a doubt in my mind the worst armor unit in the entire franchise in a game that is designed in every way to make her life miserable. Though under my watch, she was able to liberate a life from Burns' tyranny and save the world. You certainly showed them what for. Who's ready to take some punishment? Fire Emblem Binding Blade is notorious for hosting large maps and more axe-wielding adversaries than a lumberjack convention, automatically hindering the knight class to an exceptional degree, resulting in each armor unit being bad minus Douglas, who just barely passes as mediocre. Compared to her beefy brethren, Gwendolyn has the lowest base stats of the three, with bad numbers all around except for maybe defense, and joins in chapter 8 along with Bar, inevitably being outclassed by both of them with no significant advantages. This not only makes using her difficult, but training her to the point where she can fight alongside the rest of the army will cause the pace of the game to come to a screeching halt, and she only has two chapters to really boost her numbers, as the Western Isles part of the game is axe central, putting her at a constant disadvantage, and on hard mode her stats are so bad, she dies to the first archer she encounters, clearly all the armor is just for show. This is not the end of the world. You've got a point, as for all the shit the first ever female knight goes through, technically speaking Sheen is a general, not a knight. She does host relatively good growth rates for Binding Blade standards, that are the highest of the three and focused on a mixed build, which once she has enough levels under her belt, will grant her greater versatility regarding enemy encounters compared to Bores and Bath. Plus, the promotion from Knight to General in Binding Blade, though not fixing movement, grants what I'd argue to be impressively sizable stat boost and act utility. Plus, she can make use of the triangle attack, but if you actively deploy all three armor units in this game after Chapter 8, you may want to consult a therapist. Bearing the title of Worst Armor Unit is bad enough as is, but doing so in one of the most anti-armor Fire Emblem games makes it nearly impossible for Gwendolyn to be of any use and can easily be regarded as the worst unit in the entire game. Though personally, I feel she's more so the second worst unit in every 6, for I feel the one in Roy's army that deserves a Razzie is none other than... <laughs> Sophia when a poor Fire Emblem fighter joins the garrison, they're typically seen as dead weight, but at the very least you can let them die without thinking twice and be no worse for wear. Sure it sounds harsh, but I'm not running a fucking daycare center, you either get busy killing or you get busy dying. However, I find it to be an entirely different state of affairs when a poor unit has to be taken care of in order to unlock the full game. And sad to say, Sophia is that poor unfortunate soul players have to put up with. Doubly so if one chooses to invest in her and the demanding uphill battle that's tacked on for good measure only to be gifted with a shaman that on average pales in comparison to her peers. So figures when I reluctantly decide to use her, she became a beast. I swear, it's like I've been cursed so that even if I don't want to use a bad unit, they're still gonna turn out good. Farty, you really need to go back to the drawing board. <sighs> 
This half dragon hermit from Arcadia joins around roughly the middle of Binding Blade, and from this point on, all the new combatants will be pre promote or relatively strong standard units. So, can someone explain to me why the fuck Sophia joins at level 1 with worse base stat and growth total than Gwendolyn? I mean, yes, her res stat isn't bad, her class line is fine, she's got a C rank in tones, and specific growths like HP, magic, and res are strong. But all the other ones are utter tripe, and it feels like it takes the equivalent amount of time to unlock every spirit in Smash Ultimate before Sophia can get out of her starting rut. Once she does begin to hold her own, I'd say it's habitually all for naught, as Ray joins earlier with better bases and perfectly fine growths, plus Nimi, though recruited later down the line, has delectable digits and is the best stop user in the game. Plus, did I mention that Sophia only has free constitution and will be weighed down by even a flux tome? Jiminy fucking Christmas, for someone who's a half dragon, you've got the dexterity of a self conscious magazine model who's never heard of a Happy Meal. I figured my statement should serve as enough evidence as to why Sophia sucks the big one. However, what makes the situation worse is that in order to unlock the Garden chapter and by extension the entire game, Sophia must be kept alive and the goal must be seen within 25 turns. And may I remind you that for the first time player, Chapter 14 of Binding Blade is often considered to be one of the cruelest experiences in Fire Emblem. What with desert terrain, fog of war, enemy reinforcements, lots of strong units, along with a good chunk of pre-promotes and dragons, accumulating in a complete clusterfuck, where 95% of everything on normal mode will kill Sophia with the pressure of a well-aimed fart. Well, at least she gives you a guiding ring. <laughs> Were Sophia to join the Lycian League earlier on and not have such imposing alternatives, I could see as being better than Gwendolyn. And truth be told, even I was impressed with how Sophia turned out in my playthrough, especially when she was doubling by Chapter 15 and just an overall massive powerhouse. Sadly, my wishful thinking and personal experience doesn't matter, leading me to declare Sophia to be, from my perspective, the worst unit in Binding Blade. And yet there are those who pale in comparison to this pile of puke. Though I'm not surprised when the next numbnuts was so bad, she died in the time between the events of Binding Blade and its prequel. And that shameful swordmaster was. <laughs> Carla. Some of the most difficult to obtain and rarest firing units always felt to be a nice little bonus for those who go out of their way to acquire them. After all, Radiant Dawn's to farm was pretty beastly, pardon the pun, and in my eyes, Nasir was a dragon to die for. That's not to say the effort is always warranted, as Peleus, to me, failed to pack a real punch in spite of his niche, and in this particular instance, Carla was so bad, she might as well have been the dev's way of saying, Congratulations! You wasted all this time training a bad unit to obtain an even worse unit. You've proven you have no life as well as far too much time to spare doing asinine shit. Now fuck off and go spend all your money on pointless PNGs. Have a nice day! Carla's one of those units where her background and reputation are a far cry from what she can actually do, as she's meant to be one of the deadliest fighters in the life and second only to her brother Corral, receiving the title of Sword Princess. Okay, first and foremost, that's bullshit since one, Corral isn't even that good in every seven as there are far superior Alibian allies. Second, Carla is so dreadful she makes Nina look like Pent in comparison. In fact, I'd go so far as to say she makes the archers look viable, and in the case of every seven, that is just so many shades of wrong. Carla's class alone is a big problem, since Blazing Sword is one of the most anti-sword oriented titles in the franchise due to the large quantity of lance users with 1-2 to two range weapons, plus she's footlocked which is yet another pitfall. Her viability continues to deteriorate when factoring in her digits, as her bases for her drawing time suck. Seriously, 29 HP? The fuck is this shit? Her growths aren't anything special, her starting weapon is… okay I guess? And though an A rank in swords is nice, she still can't use any legendary weapon straight away, which sucks as she joins with a maximum of two more chapters before the final stage. So unless you force everyone to stay back from the battlefield and pray to Naga for good level ups, you may as well have let Barta kill his future wife for the lol she's so shit. Speaking of Barta, what's always bugged me about Carla disregarding the previously persistent problems is that in order to even attempt to recruit her, Barta has to be a level 5 warrior by chapter 31x of Hector mode, and both of them must duke out without killing the other. And though he's not the worst unit in the game, I regard Barta to be a big pile of bleh, whose deployment purposely makes Hector mode needlessly more frustrating, only to be rewarded with someone as worthless as modern day Konami, especially since not only is Corel better in every way minus one point in luck, but on average the two other Myrmidons, Guy and Lin, yes I know Lin is a lord but she's built like a Myrmidon so it counts, will have better stats in all areas minus defense, luck and res by the time they reach her starting level. And when you're training behind Lin, you know you fucked up something fierce. I feel the best way I would describe Carla is to simply ask, why? Why these numbers? Why this class? Why this join type? Why do I have to use this unit? Why can she only be obtained in this mode? Why is the ROM always gone? Honestly, I don't think I'll ever have the answer to those questions. Because by the time Carla gets her ass in line, everything she could have possibly contributed has already been achieved. And after I went through all that effort to obtain you in Hector Hard Mode, you should give me one good reason I should stop pointing my shotgun at bay and turn my attention towards you.
You got lucky. Shannon. When this countdown began, I went on for a good couple of minutes as to why I viewed Miranda to be one of the worst units in Fire Emblem 5. But I didn't have to second guess for an instant the notion that Shannon is the worst unit in Fire Emblem 5, who ascertains one of the most minor saving graces in the entire franchise. You swear the developers made him a unit just for the sake of not taking up inventory space, despite becoming the ultimate waste of space. I would be more offended by this, but God knows this wouldn't be the last time Intelligence System graces us with worthless units. You'd think they would have learned their lesson already. Shannon, like Miranda, falls in during Chapter 16b and has pathetically low base stats, which for a level 1 Myrmidon may not seem so bad at first glance. But then you come to the shocking realization that he's already promoted. What? What the fuck? Yeah, I'm surprised it's you, John, as those numbers being attached to an advanced unit is just insulting, and his growth rates don't help much either. As though HP, strength, speed, and luck are exactly 50%, the rest are all 5% minus move, which is 2. How oddly specific. To make matters worse, he's both sword and foot locked, has zero, I repeat, zero pursuit critical coefficient, his weapon rank is C level, I'm not impressed. By playing his map, you miss out on recruiting much better units like Misha and Salif, though it must be said that the same problem applies to Miranda, and overall, Shannon is so bad he makes all other sword units look like gods in comparison. It's lads like you that give war a bad name! As much as I rambled on about how awful Mr. Swoontover's actions accumulate to, he's able to worm his way ever so slightly towards the light banks to his bargain skill, which cuts the price of all items in half. Yes, he's a walking silver card. Now this sounds good on paper, but because of his late join time and the fact that by this point, there's generally not much else that requires purchasing, further compounded by the issue of the remaining stores, failing to facilitate particularly potent items, which makes his bargain ability practically pointless in the grand scheme of things. I can, however, certainly understand why people would find value in this ability, and due to its exclusivity to Shannon, grants him that tiny dose of additional utility. When all is said and done, Shannon is a prime example of a one-trick pony, offering the players a chance of a sporadic sale, but doing diddly squat the moment he steps out into the real world. Just goes to show that you can't talk your way out of every situation, especially when your numbers are this bad. Seriously, you're promoted, you fucking phony! <laughs> Liar. Lagoon's units have always been a funny one for me when it comes to impartiality, since though they often have very good stats when transformed and high movement, they also suffer from permanent one range attacks and being sitting ducks in their normal state, so I personally have a hard time formally discerning their statistical strengths, aside from the herons because you can never go wrong with a dancer. I've also got no problems evaluating Lyra, because it doesn't take a genius to figure out that she's literal cat shit, and I have no reservations in distinguishing her to be the worst Lagoon's unit in the continent of Tellius. In fact, I'd say she's the worst unit in Radiant Dawn, so rest easy Fiona, there's hope for you yet. No place to go but up! As a beast Lagoon's Lyra has the automatic downsides of a single range attack and weakness to fire, but thankfully magic in Radiant Dawn sucks. However, this alone isn't enough to make her bad, as Kanegus, Gifker, and other Lagoon's have the same problems, and yet are literal monsters thanks to their base stats, Something I doubt Lyra can take pride in. Due to her join time of Chapter 4 Part 3, most if not all the battles she can partake in will be against Creepermote, and yet Lyra makes her debut with such nauseating numbers that she can barely scratch her foes. And to my knowledge, from base she can't even damage generals, and perhaps not even women laws, and that's while she's transformed. During her normal state, her numerals are such an offense she makes Vika look like the top of the food chain. Granted, I wouldn't claim her to be completely dreadful, as her speed and skill stat are perfectly serviceable. However, I summarize it to matter not when she'll take more turns to kill a single enemy than it does to clear the entirety of Fire Emblem 4. It's obvious to me that Lyra is all bark and no bite, but I've highlighted by the fact that quite a number of girl mercenaries are better than all of the Beast of the Goose in Part 3, so the class kind of takes a backseat to begin with. And even if you did decide to let them off the leash, her sister Leaf has equal or better stats across the board, with the remaining Beast of the Goose like Ranulf, Morim, and the Royals being capable of eating her alive. And even Kaiser, who too falls short when pitted against his brethren, has better strength and defense while maintaining the same level of speed, plus the skill Quick Claw, literally making her nothing more than a house pet, and a tacky one at that. Her only saving grace, and I use that term loosely, stems from her growths like speed, skill, and luck, which are all good. But those stats were never really an issue for Lyra, whereas her strength and defense growth, which she needs, are equal to or worse than that of Leaf and Kaiser. And even with all her stats capped, the Lagoon's rules will be overall better from base and still have room to grow, just... HUH?! Not to mention, Lagoon's level up slower than Bjork units, so even if you were to grind Lyra, it will take longer than necessary and require fathom more additional time and effort, something Radiant Dawn already requires a lot of to begin with. And no, I am not using her in the Radiant Dawn Let's Play. I draw the line at Megan Fiona.
Well, there you have it, people. Liar, I would classify as the textbook definition of a catastrophe. Oh, jeez! As I interpret her performance to garner next to no benefit, and even when at her best, her efforts will be cursed onto by her far more competent competitors. And I must say, it makes me wonder if there exists a soul capable of being even more pathetic. Well, unfortunately, there's an answer to that question. <laughs> New Mystery of the Emblem Bantu. No. Just... No! This... This thing is an absolute sin and an affront to every lackluster layer about that ever existed. I mean, fucking hell, if this is how low dragons can sink, it's no wonder mankind keeps bending them over backwards. Because this travesty sure as hell ain't gonna put up a fight. Alright, let's bring it down a notch, as truthfully speaking, not every form of banter is the worst thing to happen to Fire Emblem since Echo's map design. Yes, it still sucks dick! However, one particular incarnation of what's supposed to be Tiki's Guardian is by all intents and purposes the number one worst Fire Emblem unit of all time. And I dare intelligent systems to try and make something this irredeemable again, because even if Free Houses ends up having shit units, I doubt they can get any worse than this fuckface. Before I serve this dragon's carcass up on a silver platter, let me divulge onto you the few times Bantu can be useful, specifically in the original Arcanea games. In both FE1 and FE3, Bantu had relatively middle of the road join time and could act as a decent tank while perfectly capable of dealing damage too. Nothing groundbreaking or extensive, but he was able to serve a purpose. Sure his gross was shit, but that was the case with most units back then. Plus the dragon stones had unlimited use, which aided in his sustainability. And though Tiki and Naka were better, Bantu was a perfectly serviceable squire. The DS remakes unfortunately have it out for Bantu, as in the case of Shadow Dragon, his bases and growths are boosted ever so slightly, to the point where it's not even noticeable. And though now he has access to different types of Dragon Stones, they no longer last for an unlimited amount of time, and the stat boosts that Bantu gains aren't quite enough to keep up with the new enemy levels, so he's quite bad. And then there's new mystery of the emblem Bantu. Warning, the following segment contains copious amounts of swearing, salt, and rage that is not suitable for all audiences. Therefore, the Fire Emblem Heroes attack sound effect will be used to center on all foul language and profanity until Blazing Night's anger has subsided. You have been warned. Jesus Christ, this shit is staying the absolute worst. It's bad enough Shadow Dragon barely boosts the stats, but for some asinine f reason, the f kids at Intelligent Systems thought it would be a brilliant f idea to load them back to his NES numbers, completely ignorant of the fact that the enemy unit, especially dragons, are much stronger than before. So not only can this lip dip f Duggan not do his f job, but all of his adversaries will spread his ass cheeks and shove their c inside of him so hard, he'll give buff to more children than Awakening and Fate combined. This piece of shit also has the same f as growth rate as before, without unlimited f weapon use that is also harder to f come across, and to top off this sh sandwich, those stones don't deal super effective damage, which by the f way, is a must for FE12. So good news, Bantu, you're even more worthless than the sh that comes out of EA's mouth. Oh yeah, he also only has 6 movement, which is fan f I can't take this sh anymore, this guy's so Are you okay over there? You seem pretty out of it after all that ranting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, thank goodness. I don't think anyone should be subjected to that trauma again. Uh, what's that talking about again? Oh, you mean Bantu! Well, um, I think I've made it pretty clear why Bantu is utter dragon dunk. But the reason I believe he's the worst unit of all time, or at least the new mystery version, is down to the notion that every Fire Emblem unit, even the ones on this list, I'd argue have something positive to them, no matter how minor it is. Shannon had bargain, Laia has speed and skill, Carla has high skill and weapon rank, Gwendolyn, Sophia and Fiona have statistically strong growth potential, Violin has mounted utility, Soph can attain treasure, and Miranda has wrath. I could stop here, but let's explore some other examples, such as Radiant Thorn Astrid who comes in with Paragon, Amelia has access to the Paladin class line, Talia can also use Rav, Thomas doesn't take too long to promote, Wallace can be useful on Lin mode, Nino has a strong growth spread, Mech has solid availability and weapon rank, Arden is bulky and can gain the Pursuit Ring, and Gareth has Blood Tide to boost allies. The point is, yes, they are all bad units, but at least I can find something worth salvaging. Bantu... Bantu literally has jack and shit, and it's no wonder when doing research for this video did his name keep popping up, and when even I, the man who made Sophia, Lin and Gwendolyn absolute monsters, find nothing of value from a Fire Emblem unit, what else needs to be said? Which is why New Mystery of the Emblem Bantu takes the number one spot as the absolute worst Fire Emblem unit of all time. This has been Blazing Knight. 
I wish you all a great night, take care, and though victories in Fire Emblem are often the result of careful planning and the strength of your party, logic dictates that not everyone is capable of winning the day and are better suited to being bench warmers. But even if these ridiculous recruits hinder more than help, and truth be told should be avoided at all costs, if you can find it in your heart to put up with a bad unit and give them a chance, they may just end up getting in your good books. Take it from someone who turned a laughing stock into a legend. Thank you all for watching today, I hope you had a great time and enjoyed the video and the first of many remakes yet to come. Please let me know what you thought in the comments and what do you think are some of the absolute worst Fire Emblem units of all time? Whether it be due to personal experience or just based on objective factors, I'd love to know. I'd also like to say an especially big thank you to Chris Digital Dreams, Elizabeth Purcell, Sam Spicer and Kaoru Fujimaki for providing the voice of Anne in this video. I couldn't have done it without you lot, thank you so very much. And I'd also like to thank my Discord members for helping me do research for this video. I honestly had no idea some of the units got this bad. Also, please don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe as well, and hit that notification button. Follow me on Twitter, Discord, and Amino. And if you want to go the extra mile and help contribute to the channel, please consider donating to my Patreon page to help make these videos possible and to receive some additional bonuses. And on that note, I'd like to say a massive, massive, massive thank you to all my patrons who helped make these videos possible. Without you, I couldn't do any of this, and I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart again and again for making this possible. Thank you all so much. I love you. And shoutouts go to Nate Perkins, Alex, Chaos Sableye, Vanessa Westfall, Justin Konovich, Vincent Clark, Midnight Castle, Attack of Fan 32, Maggieful, by the way, thank you so much once again, I absolutely love this, Arkarai, Jeremy Redinger, The Main Idea, and Farron and Ape 392. Thank you all so much, you people are the absolute best. Anyway, that's it from me, I'll see you all next time.